Welcome to Talking In Stations. We're going to be talking about EVE Online today. I am Matterall, and I'm here with Chen. Hello, hello. And uh, as the first part of the show, we're going to uh, meet a guest from CVA. We'll introduce him in just a second. Hold on. Uh, first, I want to tell you that we're going to go over economics today, and we're going to talk about the monthly economic report that came out for June. There's some sneak information there, some sneak peek about July. Uh, numbers are down, so that's to be expected because of the PCU. We'll get into all that a little bit later. We'll also look at the prices, take a look at Plex, take a look at injectors, what's going on there. Uh, but first, we want to run over and do some news. So let's go to the news desk here. So, uh, Shen, one of the things that happened that uh, we're looking at here is a wormhole fight that we had talked about yesterday. And I'll just read the first paragraph here, written by Tiberius, who actually streamed this live earlier today. Strange Danger Repels, Exit, and Hosa. That's the title. Here we go. What was geared up to be one of the largest and most influential, one of the most anticipated fights in recent wormhole history came to a very anticlimactic head earlier today during the armor timers for Stranger Danger's main Fortizar and support structures. For unknown reasons, Exit Strategy and Wholesale Operations relinquished or lost, uh, unclear which, whole control during the key opportunities for defending the coalition, with, which allowed them to infiltrate a tremendous amount of pilots for their defense. I'll just read the second paragraph. Oso was not without their own allies in this fight as well. According to sporadic reports, Wholesale was able to infiltrate a force of nearly, of early USTZ players, sorry, EUTZ players, that were supposed to reinforce reinforced their weak showing for a Thursday. For a Thursday comprised rumored to be MGLA, Parabellum, Quantum in Inquisition. Uh, let me stop there. So those are the allies of HOSA who are uh, wholesale operations. So those guys were able to get uh, to help out. Uh, the attacking force was projected to have approximately 175 to 200 pilots ready for the engagements, but ultimately the invading coalition decided to allow the structures they reinforced yesterday to repair and log their fleet off with sporadic reports of Poshman filaments being activated to take them back to high sec space. So that's how they made their exit. They exited. I thought wormholers didn't like those filaments. I guess they're handy when you want to uh, take your guys and leave. Uh, there are a few key critical points in which we need to consider when evaluating this engagement. Firstly, the timers that the attackers received after reinforcement happen to be what appears to be an incredibly inconvenient time for allies across the board, 1800 UTC. On a Thursday, keep in mind, uh, that is 6 p.m. in London, which is typically when most people are returning home from work and setting down for an evening uh, at the end of the week. It is also 4 a.m. at the earliest in Australia, which for anyone from a nine, with a 9 to 5 schedule would pose a significant challenge uh, to their ability to work during the day. Why don't I just finish this? Next, the defending force had a tremendous amount of ships and resources at their disposal to repel a defending force, which is evident to some that perhaps the enemy force didn't even know about. Every single person in the defending fleet was able to get a Tempest or a TFI, that's Tempest Fleet. Tempest Fleet, help me out. Tempest Fleet issue. Issue, okay. <laughs> Tempest Fleet issue for, uh, for free, fully loaded... Uh, with an escape frigate and 1400 millimeter guns. As many are aware, the Brawler's Paradise was a bit of a paradoxical update in which resists from modules were nerfed across the board by 15%. This significantly lowers the threshold that brawling ships can receive punishment and decrease the amount of ships that are needed to, com to completely delete them from the field. Uh, uh so from here, I'll just take, I'll just explain like some details, the tactics. Sure. So 1400 is long range artillery. So they have really high uh, DPH, uh, but their fire rate is uh, 
very slow. So we have a brawling ship a doctrine versus a 1400 artillery. If you can go get close to them, uh, that TFI or Tempest fleet is gonna be vaporized really quickly. Basically, that's that's how it goes. I think. Thank you. Uh, okay, so let me finish this up. Alpha Doctrine at this magnitude would allow the defenders to, to sidestep any capital class, and sub-capital class for that matter, logistics that the enemy would field and slowly wither away the enemy's ability to do damage. A 1400 millimeter arty, which is artillery, Tempest, uh, which is the battleship, can do approximately 10k raw damage per volley depending on its fit. And the defending force was able to easily field 200 of them. So 200 times 10k equals 2 million potential raw alpha damage. On the other side, Hosa and Exit uh, fielded their typical medium-heavy armor doctrines of Lashaks and Dracoviks, which are ramping DPS ships that are relatively weak to large alpha strike comp compositions and would not have the same power projection to sufficiently sidestep fax rep power in a timely enough manner. I think that's what you were pointing to, right? They could essentially get volleyed off the field because they're not waiting for their damage to ramp up. And yeah, so so this is what you see with like Macario fleet and Tempest fleet if you fleet. Like let's say if you're versus another like a Baden fleet, you can literally one volley their one, one, one ship off, so like one volley, one hit, one hit, one hit. So, so you're basically deleting their ship. So what you're going to see in comms, what you're going to hear in comms is three, two, one, fire. That's basically one DPH shot from everyone in that fleet to an enemy, let's say, battleship or lodge. Thank you. And this is the final uh, paragraph here. Again, this is a report written by uh, DIS's Tiberius. Uh, who uh, who streamed this live on his channel. Uh, I forget what the name of that channel is, but they have a program. Um, I should know that. Uh, here it is, the conclusion of the battle report. The reality of the situation is that Hosa Exit, those two, that group comprised of two teams, basically, had fielded their fleet with the numbers they had and the compositions they brought uh, there. It was a pretty good chance that they would have... Uh, lost a large portion of their entire fleet if they chose to take the engagement as is. On a personal note, I stand pretty disappointed as J-Space has not seen a potential for this magnitude of a fight in quite some time. Through a combination of what appears to be poor communication and management on the attacker's side and a string of luck on the defenders through the spawning of frigate hole uh, and losing and loose hole control, this eviction and fight was doomed very early on. All right. Uh, and also, there were some people here in chat that were saying that they're still in the hole, ready to defend. I assume they're part of the defenders. Wholesale was outformed, and they backed down. Well, why didn't we just read that, Sudicon? Thank you very much. Uh... Kind of kidding, but kind of not kidding. Uh, probably should have read that top line thing. But that was a nice report written, uh, not not that well read by me, uh, about wormhole space and an eviction that we reported on yesterday. So that concludes that for now. Next, I want to move to um, Nullsec, but this is out in... Gosh, I'm not exactly sure, but we have a guest here from CVA. Uh, you may know them from Block. And uh, this is Kyle Saltz. How are you doing, Kyle? Pretty good. Honor to be here. Nice to see you again. We've had you on before talking about Pravi when it was uh, in peril, when they were uh, evacuating, essentially. And uh, it's good to have you back now. You guys, since then, what have you done since uh, Providence fell? Well, uh, uh, what we have been doing is actually having a lot of fun. We, I mean, we had just come off of a, a very long two years and six month conflict with RC. I mean, it was just a really toxic conflict. And getting out of that, we were able to just refresh. We don't have to worry about 10 soft timers every day. And we can relax. We can make money, uh, do a lot of commerce, and mine, rebuild, and, and really focus on improving and doing an overall overhaul, excuse me, upon our own alliance and how we 
how we do things. Yeah, so you're basically, after uh, the responsibilities of Providence were no longer for you to uphold, and you guys moved to, I believe you went straight away up into Snuff Area Syndicate, and were relaxing out there. Yeah, Syndicate, Placid, we started immediately just kind of, I wouldn't say uh, crabbing, but we also got into local conflicts, and Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't want to join any Blue Donuts. We stayed neutral with the Goon Conflict. And we didn't want to blue a bunch of entities within the local region. And we just had good small gang conflict where everyone can enjoy it. We would bat phone for each group, you know, and it's just kind of third party in some conflicts. But I heard, ultimately just trying to be a positive uh, force in the area. I heard you started doing some training and you were building up armaments in order to maybe come back to Providence. Uh, but I, I did hear the training part with snuff, like you were practicing with snuff. Uh, on how to use well, we capitals. Have, we have, we do have guys with uh, Snuff right now. Uh, they're doing their thing. I, I, heck, me personally, I'd love to see them back, but you know what? They're doing great things over there. I wish them the best. Uh, hopefully one day we'll all merge together and uh, do better things in the future. Mm. Uh, we have, uh, yes, we have definitely been building up a lot. Well, me personally, that's that's all I do usually. It's just build, build, and build. Uh but we've mainly been trying to focus on just like the culture, the environment, and focusing on our future. And we had to do a lot of stuff. I mean, from just changing our doctrines, changing how we fight, uh, getting everybody organized. And that was really important for us. And, and ultimately, just relax and have fun while doing good things. Yeah, good. Um, so what happened, what's happened lately, though? Uh, we've been hearing a lot about CVA, and I think it's, is it, where's the, the battle arena that you're in now, is the, the oh, region? With, we're within the same area that we were staying in, around 5F, usually that's the centerpiece of most of the conflict. Um, how this came about was uh, UF had been fighting Shadow Cartel. Shadow Cartel took a bunch of their moons and... Uh, they kind of stayed on our couch and we had bat flown from them. They had bat flown from us. We had been pretty good with each other. Um, they then declared war on another entity within the local region, which is Vega and some other groups within the area. And after a while, they kind of, we, we kind of warmed up their welcome on our couch. We're like, Hey, can you move? And we, we politely asked them, Hey, uh, <laughs> get off my couch. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. It was like, hey, we, <laughs> Dude. we accepted you guys in, but it's it's causing you know a lot of extra conflict within the area. Yeah, and you guys have your own region of space, which you know you guys used to live in. You know, you guys could go back there now. I'm still thinking and, about that. Uh, Dude, I want to watch TV. Can you can you get off the couch? Do you mind like just yeah. leaving just so, leaving the apartment for a day? <laughs> we we told him, hey, listen, can, we gave him seven days. Hey, can you move out? We're not going to try to mess with you. Can you just move out of the sector? And so what they did was. In nice fashion, they decided to reinforce all of our structures. Uh, I linked a really great video uh, in your ch- public chat. Of It really gives a good version of the first beginnings of the conflicts. It emphasizes our mistakes, our, our positives. It's really well uh, put on. A G- a John Ball put it, uh, made that one. The second video, I'm, I'm chafing at the bit for him to release because he does a really good job explaining the entire conflict. Um, we were very successful with our new doctrines, our new groups, and I don't think that UF really knew that we would be able to form as much people as we have been doing. Because we were doing like 20, 30 people at fleets on average, but then when the conflict kicked off, a lot of guys started logging back in, and now we're pushing 60, 70 guys sometimes in fleets, you know, 50, you know, up to 70 guys. Wow. And so we're, we're, you have a force that's, you know, you know, you can make fun of us all you want. You have a force that's been fighting RC for two and a half years. We Wrecking are crew. very good with fleet doctrines. We know what we're doing. We, we, we've we worked together for many years, a lot of us. So we've been doing very good in fleet battles. And even sometimes when we're horribly outnumbered, you know, you, you see some of the battle reports where we are actually outnumbered and we're actually winning, which is awesome. Now, we've been using a lot of different doctrines. We mean Tengus, Lokis. Um, uh, even Tempest, while our enemies use primarily Harbingers. Now, Harbingers have a very good alpha. Um, they're cheap, they're replaceable. And if you ever watched Enemy at the Gates, I mean, these Russians are literally like, you take the Harbinger, it's, 
And when this guy dies, you get the X Harbinger. It's literally the old. Oh, the pick old, up the guy's rifle that dies that's charging yeah. along with you, right? It, it's. I mean, we, we Har- slaughtered almost a hundred. Uh, like last and, big battle. And Harbingers. Sorry, Harbingers are Amarian ships, which are something that you guys are particular about. You use Amarian ships since that's what you identify with. We do identify with Amarian ships, but I mean, in order to be a, a positive and good null force or any force whatsoever, you have to go with whatever doctrine works best. What, what you know? So we can't focus on Amarian ships like we used to. I mean, a long time ago, CBA was only Amarian characters, only Amarian ships. But in today's society, we need to go to that best ship. We need to go to whatever works to kill the other guy's ship. Mm. And yeah. so... I had to diversify. Good yeah, for you. we had to. I mean, we had to do this. And, and at all, a lot, we've had to uh, change a lot of our policies. And Gian's done a great job coming in, helping the FC, you know, kind of mod- modernizing, if you could say the term, uh, our, our, our fleets. And uh, we've been doing very well. Um, and in some conflicts, we've we've been dropping Hadreds. I know recently we got caught. Hey, it's not honest. Yeah. Hey, we, we messed up. We got caught. So that's but the battle report we were looking at yesterday, where you guys lost oh, yeah. uh, some dreadnoughts to LSH. Oh, yeah. That was that was good fun. I mean, we've been using those for a while now against LSH and those guys. They have never uh, escalated before. So we, it almost felt like when we were back in Pravi, when we were using subcaps and you know. Uh, we'd usually outnumber RC a lot, and so they would drop Haas, Dreads, to be a force equalizer. Well, we've been doing that as a force equalizer against the uh, UF. And so it's been really fun. A lot of guys are enjoying it. And so, hey, they're getting killed. I mean, our, our CSM candidate, lucrative business opportunity, I think he had 15 kills with his uh, Haas Dread the other day. So we're having fun doing this. And so we knew eventually we were going to get caught, but unfortunately when they did escalate, most of our guys were so thrilled about using Hadreds that a lot of us refitted for Haas instead of anti-caps. <laughs> oh, so you couldn't take on the other, the opposing capitals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, we were so, that was, hey, we took that hit honestly on the chin. You know, we yeah. have dreads to back that up. And it was honestly a great learning event, but also it kind of taught us a lesson. Hey, make sure we have a bunch of anti-caps backed up because Usually we do. It's just that day we, we just weren't prepared for that dread bomb, which we thought they'd never use. They used. And it taught us a good lesson, and it was fun. I mean, well, we did slaughter a lot of their subcaps. I mean, we why, lost some dreads. Why weren't you expecting, this is not an attempt to corner you, but why weren't you expecting LSH to escalate? It's what they do. They escalate well, to capitals. St- like You'd think that, but mm-hmm. we've been fighting. And if you look at battle reports going back weeks and weeks, if not months, now We've been slaughtering them in their Harbingers. They've just been reshipping into Harbingers. And we've literally been, we've dropped dreads on LSH. And you guys keep on saying, oh, these guys are going to, you know, they, this is what they do. They, they hunt. Well, this is what they have not been doing. Mm, we've been dropping dreads. We've been doing a lot of this stuff. And we've just been killing them. And they, there has been no escalation. So wow. it's, it lulled us into a sense of, of I would say, we didn't we didn't think they would, they would escalate. So um, we, I mean, Prime example, we slaughtered over 100 Harbingers the other day with LSH. We, I think we killed over 40, 50 of them of LSH Harbingers, and they just took it on the chin. Wow. So, wow. I mean, you, you do that, and you, you don't expect them to. Yeah, well, it's, it's very we, disciplined. We mistake. It's very disciplined on their part to go ahead and sacrifice some ships for an opportunity later. I think I was just yeah. looking at some Lokis uh, in this fight. Beautiful footage. Oh, yeah, that, that, that we, we did. A, I mean, we've done a really good job. In the beginning of the war, we, we UF did overstretch themselves. They had already been in conflict with several entities. Um, declaring war on us was probably not a very smart thing to do. I mean, it's like Germany going against Russia during World War II. They opened up a second front. They had a lot of guys against them. So even with our doctrines... We could still beat them, but then we had more allies as well because guess what? You know, we didn't want to pile in on them. We had good fights. So after a couple really great fights, really even good fights, um, we were destroying a lot of their structures, and we said, hey, listen, we don't want to destroy you guys outright because you guys are a good – you're a healthy version of this area. We don't want to kill content. People are – you know, across Eve, you know, when they kill content, the region is lesser for that. So we told the alliance, like, hey, listen, we, we are – have the advantage we are winning um would you like a ceasefire we'll give you 30 days we i think that was a zipper guys. yeah and uh they uh 
uh, after after that, they said, okay, we're gonna, the alliance leader took it, and uh, he went and uh, he said, well, we'll contact you back and give us a week to, to come to a conclusion. So they had their alliance meeting. They stalled for a week, and they said, no, we're going to continue on the war. What they did was mainly they stalled for time to get an ally, which here came in Loschlik, Naya, Schlupin as their backup, and which perpetuated the conflict longer. And so we started fighting them as well. And it just, you know, we've had some great fights <laughs> and great, great content. I'm uh, sorry, I'm in my police no, cruiser. Now. I know, that's hilarious. Right it now. just sounds like you're getting into a jumpsuit with a bunch of zippers, but uh, just letting the <laughs> audio audience yeah. know. Go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's it's been really great. I mean, we, we took that on the chin. We have to accept, you know, we mess up sometimes. We, we got overconfident because we've had some great wins. And, uh, you know, our enemy, they've shown multiple times that they're willing to to lose a lot of Harbingers to get that win. Because I, I think one time they lost another 50 Harbingers. We were just mowing through them with our Tempest. And, but they got, they killed the Athenor. I mean, it, it was just, you know, a bit of, yeah. each side, you know, comes our way with this. Like having a feel like victory. Like we slaughtered them. Yes, we got a lot of great kill mills. Yeah. You know, they, they got the ejector. They killed the Athenor. You know, both sides are, you know, pumped. And it's, you know, we're not being toxic with each other. That's really the most important thing I think of when this conflict, we're not being toxic with each other. We're, you know, it's, it's a good content fight. And I yeah. think that's what a lot of conflicts in EVE is missing is that good, dare I say, wholesome fights or, or conflicts. Yeah, keep it in the game, right? Like, yeah, we, we, we didn't really see in, in, in Pravi. I mean, you get to know people like in the, in the Pravi fight, we got to know people very well. And that made personal digs all the more, you know, worse. Like when they knew, you know, knew about you or they knew about your family or something like that. And it, when you take it to that level, it just, it, it, it honestly, it's taxing. And it's, yeah. it's taxing for everybody. And well, hold on a second. That's very, up. it's very important because we're running into a lot of this toxicity and abuse uh, because of the war. It's just getting really ugly and there's other reasons for it as well. So it, it, it's a good idea to kind of emphasize that it's a desirable thing to play this game, to play competitively, to be tough on each other, but not to try to do meta damage, right? That's what you're saying. When you know about somebody's family and you, you take advantage yeah, and, of that, that's bad form. It, it, both sides, I was saying that probably conflict, uh, both sides are not angels. We both messed up. We both, st we did not uphold to what we should do. And I think mm -hmm. that us being able to get away from that that environment was good for us because yeah. um, when we ever seek to re-engage, you know, we're going to focus on being that better entity. We will focus on, you know, being that better person. And Do I think a lot of us are just enjoying this fight right now. I, I, I love it. Do you think that uh, the, the toxicity is actually something that drives people away from the game, by the way? Yeah, I've unfortunately I've seen it firsthand. I, I have a really great friend in RC. Um, he left the game, and he was a good friend of mine. I met him in Vegas. I had drinks with him. Uh, an incident happened where you know he kind of was betrayed by somebody, and it, and it just he, he left the game from it. And I honestly really appreciated that guy. I really respected that guy, and I think the game is lesser without him in it. Yeah. Um. And I think it happens on both both sides. And no, I it's a cultural that, problem that Eve has yeah. never really come to terms with. It's a, it's a cultural problem. Okay, I, I, go ahead. Get, get off that, yeah. But other than this, up here, um, we've been recruiting. We've been getting a lot of new faces, new people. And this conflict isn't like the big, you know, blue donut. This conflict right here, it's it's good fights. It's mid, you know, you know. You uh, maybe up you see it like a hundred, hundred versus a hundred, or sixty versus sixty. This is a very even conflict. I mean, when Shadow Cartel was backing UF early on, Shadow Cartel, if a full CTA could probably drown us. Great props to Shadow Cartel because they're like, we understand this is just good content. They're not taking hundred man fleets to drown. You know, they're taking you know thirty, forty dudes having a good fight they go back they're not trying to you know destroy the content because they realize that both groups uf cda we're all trying to grow we're all trying to be a positive group in the area mm -hmm. and they're not just drowning it because they understand they don't want to kill content you destroy off a side you destroy a group that's trying to rebuild you know what's going to happen you, Got it. It, you, eve is lesser 
I mean, look at what's happening in Pravi right now. Pravi's dead. RC guys are just, you know, they're probably bored as hell over there. You know, excuse my language, but well, they're just bored. I think Nullsec, or Nullsec Nia Shulpin uh, is, is probably on their way to change that. Who knows? Who uh, knows? I, don't know. <laughs> I might join them. I don't know. <laughs> there, is, there is what looks to be a, a different war brewing now with uh, our wrecking crew that sits in Providence right now. Uh, having, uh, looks like Nalsechnia Shulpin, maybe even Snuff, um, kind of eyeballing them. Do you think something's going to come of that? Do you have any uh, information? Hey, I, I could always hope, you know, I could always hope and dream. <laughs> right. You know, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm one of the most diehard Pravi people in CVA. I know a lot of us, we have to, we have to, ourselves, we know, like, listen, when we come back to Pravi, we have to do this right. It might take another two years before we go back to Pravi because, when we do, it's going to be hard, it's going to be good, and it's going to be with enough people to secure the region. Right. And right now, we're not there, and so we have to do it. But you know what? This mm -hmm. distance is probably the best thing for us and the worst thing for RC, because RC was united because they were united to hate us for what we stood for, for NRDS, for all this other stuff. And that was their goal. Now, with us not there, their own toxicity, I don't want to say toxicity, there's a lot of good guys in RC. Their own their own culture, it does them in. You look what's happened with uh, clever use of neutral tunes, their own civil wars. You look at all the guys that have left RC just to come around and kill RC because they don't want to be considered crabbers. They don't want to be considered this culture of empire building. So they left RC just to attack them again. So us being away from them is their own worst enemy because they have to just deal with themselves. And mm. that, the longer we're away, the weaker RC appears to be sometimes just because of their, their own conflicts. I mean, we saw what snuff could do to them. Snuff did some amazing stuff, uh, work to them. Um, our dread building. we I, I was, that was where my biggest focus was. Uh, when we left Pravi four to eight hours a day, I'm mining building and building up that dread caching. Cause you remember that with a big snuff conflict over their Fortis are, what was one of the biggest uh, turning points on the armor timer? I want to say was the CVA dread bomb. When you have a hundred CVA dudes in dreads with four reship dreads already ready for them, that was very powerful. That hmm. probably what led RC not to want to escalate because they knew, holy crap, our you know CVA can field a hundred dread pilots and then reship them four times. Now, fast forward, this is you know eight nine months later. How much do you think I've built since then? You being a builder. Back, shipyard builder. <laughs> when we go back, it's not going to be pretty. I guarantee that. And uh -huh. guess what? You know, I love RC. I love that, 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 that everlasting goal. But what we have to also understand as CVA is that we, this is something, this is a long-term goal. We're not there yet. We got mm -hmm. a lot to do. We got to do some soul searching with our own organization. We have to build up train a lot of new bros and it almost makes me want to cry you get a new bro into cba we're training him up and he's never lived in cba never lived in Pravi. he's never experienced that that lifestyle that culture that 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 camaraderie that Pravi Bach is so and it's saddening for me but you know what though my goal is that one day we're gonna have a probably block back into Pravi, and so you know my son might inherit a province with a cba they in it but that's my goal. I can't say that that's the alliance goal. Got it. But we know that we got so, years to go. So someday you're, you're going back. The, the mission is at some point to get back into the promised land of Providence where you guys were from. That would be nice. It would be perfect. But you know what? Where it's only going to happen when we're ready. And we got a lot of stuff to do. Like I said, it could take yeah. another two years before we even look that direction. All and right. us well, being away from Providence. It's, it's RC's worst enemy. Yeah, I like that long-term planning. Thanks, Kyle. appreciate you coming by. It's always nice to talk with you. My pleasure. Hey, CVA is always recruiting, and we're doing great things over here. All right. Well, good luck. I take care. All right. So uh, next we have to move over to economics, uh, which is something that we wanted to look at. Uh, we have the monthly economic report that actually came out. We'll bring that up in just a second. But um, why don't we actually start on... Uh, what should we look at, Shen? Should we look at the uh, anything going on that's interesting inside the economy? Yeah, I think Abby wrote a quick note. Uh, so we've seen total destroyed regions dealt is below Forge, uh, but above Long Track. So I think oh, the second yeah. highest, right? Yeah. So 
Uh, well, that's from, the, that's from the MER. Let me grab that so we can talk yeah. about it. We yeah. might as well do that. Um, just one second. Well, actually, why don't you go ahead and introduce what we're going to look at while I find it. Yeah, so we have the total destroyed uh, regions. So that's regions with destroyed values. So Delve right now is below the forge, and but ab above long track. So that means, uh, so Empire Space seems as much or more destructions than Warzone right now. So we have seen during the last month that uh, the war has really been slowed down with just skirmish fleets around from the happy side. Uh, we have we, we do we we have seen some like uh, counter offensive from the Imperium lately with some shield timers, but they never follow up any armor timer. So. Uh, it, the war has been really slowed down after the structure grind uh, in Helm's Deep, and it has been almost, I think, three months after that. And that's what, why we're seeing right now, I think the first time or the second time, the Delph has dropped below the Forge. And, but there's an announcement coming this Saturday that there's a potential uh, that Pappy is going to scale up the conflict and bring in more ships and more uh, population into the war zone or more people committed to the war zone to really try to take that one constellation. So maybe potentially in the next month or in July this month, uh, it, MER, when you can see right the, the destroyed uh, by regions, itself will go right back up. Right. So who knows? Maybe we'll see of that. Hmm. All right. So you think that's what the message is this weekend, that there's going to be a recommitment of some sort? Well, like I think we have guessed it, right? There's only yeah, two yeah. way out of that, right? So one is back off. Which okay. Is no, nearly impossible. No <laughs> special info. Okay. Uh, yeah. But but you're seeing the same thing the rest of us are seeing as uh, that's very logical, which is if you're going to make an announcement, it has to be something that's new. You don't announce what you've already been doing unless you plan to recommit to that. Which uh, and I, it has to be something big too, right? For multiple alliance leaders to announce it to their own alliance. I thought about that. Maybe it's just something that they need to clarify too, right? Like, uh, I'm not yet willing to make a big, big deal out of this. I just have a feeling maybe it was the Alliance Tournament announcement that there may be a big deal out of something that's not that different. So we'll just wait and see, I suppose. Okay, looking at total value uh, by region, and you do see the Forge is ahead of Delve. Delve is actually tied with the Citadel. Interesting. So... Kind of a lull. And uh, let's see, where else should we look? Well, let's start at the very top where we normally go. You're going to see some, some very clear indications that uh, the economy during June and probably July as well. That would be the last two. Make sure you guys can see that. Yep. All right. So if you're looking at red, that's actually production. Here's the key up here, right? What's produced, yellow is what's mined, blue is destroyed. So don't be confused by that. They should probably flip those numbers, right? Uh, destroyed should be red and blue should be um, what's created. Uh, so as you can see, the big thing is that uh, ever since this giant spike here, you see that cone? Uh, that was from the announcement time that production values were going to change. Uh, in other words, the ingredients you need to build things is going to change for ships, especially bigger ships. That announcement, all the way up to when it happened, which would be right about here, huge building spike. So everybody went into production to build everything cheaper before the prices changed for building things. And since then, it's really been a slow, well, actually a very rapid slide down that's only slowing now a little bit. But through June and through July, also through May, these are the months that we're looking at here, these three months down here. Pretty severe production slowdowns. So that would be like a huge stock that's in uh, every industrialist hangar right now. So it takes yeah. a long time to deplete those stocks. Maybe just take one battery in Delft, who knows? <laughs> yeah. So the look at the war though. The war started over here, right in the middle. Let's see if you can see that. Um, and that is July uh, 2020. There's a big hump right before it here. Uh, but in July, that's when the war starts. And you can see that overall destruction numbers 
uh, kind of down a little, but they're they're going along their seasonal averages uh, with a little bit of a bump here in October, November, November. That's when we had a lot of Keepstar fights in uh, Delve. When when Pappy was entering Delve, there were uh, five Keepstars that were dropped. I think four destroyed. The fifth one went in. Uh, and then uh, you have this giant uptick here that's an anomaly because that was the M2 battle. It was just such a big battle that expensive things were destroyed, shooting that thing, shooting the destruction numbers off the charts for two different engagements, right? You had the uh, armor timer and then the hull timer. Uh, both those things together created a massive spike. Then it kind of normalized after that and then started to go down. I, I point to April uh ever since april that is when i believe the end of april is pretty much when the uh, siege began and you can see everything has slowed down since then and that's what our experience is when we visualize it but here it is economically uh, evidence that uh, the siege has slowed down overall destruction numbers for everybody uh so we can see the uh, both the production and dist destruction numbers going down <clears throat> so maybe that's related to the pcu right so there are less people doing things uh longer in game uh during the past i think three months so yeah. that's why both numbers are going down same with mining going down which is interesting that's mining value going down it could be that the mining values themselves have changed so the activity remains the same but the values change and therefore the amount mind value wise has actually come down it could be that people have stopped mining since there is a surplus of minerals these days part of the production changes that came through were to take ships that were built with just minerals and say you know what you only need a third of those minerals that's a just a number i'm putting out of out of my hat here or you only need half the amount of minerals that you needed before now you need gas now you need ice products now you need these other things so there's a surplus of minerals since not many are being used uh, as fast as they were. Uh, so there you see um, mining value has gone down, maybe because people are slowing down because there's a surplus on the market, with the exception of Morphite, right? We'll have a look at that in a second. Yeah, I mean, mining value going down, I don't think it's only like standard minerals, but uh, I think part of that is also Mungu, part of that is... Uh, mm. ice mining so it's a combination of everything ice, oh everything good point is going down. i so, didn't know that so mine that, and that think, makes sense no it makes sense because it says yeah. mined and you you mine gas i suppose uh, it technically it's called harvesting but yeah. it's the same thing as harvesting resources yeah you're not you're not my you're not mining just asteroids there okay that's good to know so yeah because from what i can see from the market at least uh, it's, it's a, the price is going straight down like for all the t1 minerals so there's if if that's only the t1 based uh let's say compressed ore or just ore from f just for t1 minerals they will plumb like even lower than that right well mining has not slowed in veil of the silent which is where fraternity alliance is and winter coalition you can see they really uh, pretty much double everybody else's mining at, at least, maybe triple, depending on who you are. Let's have a look at that a little closer. They're at nearly two trillion in mining in Vale. And the next closest one is very interesting. It's actually domain, high sec Amarian space, which is not surprising. It's such a big region, but it must mean that everybody else's mining is really slowed. Or again, uh, depending on uh, the values have dropped. Yeah, look at that. Domain beats Forge in mining. Okay, yeah. and NPC bounties. This is a big one that we look at often to see how the econ economics of owning territory, uh, how healthy that is. And we can see here, Veil of the Silent again tops the list with over 2 trillion. Uh, and you have Kalevala Expanse. So uh, that's Horde. Kalevala Expanse, that's Horde plus like the Panfam, Panfam region. Yeah. I, I so, shouldn't have called them out though, because they're half as much as uh, Tranquility, uh, sorry, Fraternity is. I mean, so the, the thing with Fraternity is nobody can challenge them or put any threat on the table for them uh, for at, at their time zone. 
Uh, so I think the biggest threat to them, honestly, is us, uh, AOM. Uh, uh, but for us, we're even not even like one tenth their size. So mm. there's a giant difference. And what they're trying to do right now is cleaning up their threats, right? So we can see their war with Snuff. Uh, so I think after Snuff, after Adele, it's going to be us. So uh, Norris is really trying to uh, put down any threat for them. So that's yeah. why you see those numbers are going high, high up. Again, Noros in the middle of this picture, economically, he's created uh, with Fraternity an engine for wealth making. At the same time, he's playing some pretty hard bar, hardball politics because he's the one that told uh, his members in Fraternity in a message that went out in Mandarin, so it wasn't... Uh, meant for everybody to consume, but it got translated. Rich Richmond did a translation along with you, Shen, uh, to localize it and make it understandable. Uh, after we read it, by the way, I asked Noros, did that, was that accurate? Did we misrepresent you in any way? And he said, no, a little, uh, at the end, there was a little bit that wasn't, but that was mostly what I meant to say. So confirmation that it was mostly accurate. And what he said basically was that, uh, you know, we look, it looks like we're going to finish this war or something's going to happen that we're going to announce Saturday in two months, in 60 days. That's throwing a card down on the table, isn't it? In some way, he's saying, look, Pappy, you got two months to finish this. It, it could be that's the message that's being sent. Or it, it could be an estimate that he doesn't really put any value into. You know, 60 day, you know, 60 days. But if they go over, they go over. Who knows? We don't really know how stern he is about that. Is that a deadline? What's he talking about? Or is it just a prediction? I mean, if it exceeds uh, 60 days, then it will be another propaganda material for, for Imperium. <laughs> yeah, at the very least. That's why these leaders, when they are cornered into saying what a victory condition is, they squirm out of the way. They don't want to say what a victory condition is. Uh, or they put the goalpost so far that it can't really be tabulated, right? Like, um, you know, as long as we survive, we win this war on Imperium's side. And then on Pappy's side, is where we, we're going to drive them from the game. Like, these things are not really measurable, and they're not even... They're not um, anything that you can really even point to as, um, as achievable. Because, because you can redefine both those things so much. Uh, as long as one person survives, does that mean the Imperium survives? Or if you, uh, you know, if if the Imperium is still around, but they're a corporation, are they actually out of the game? In other words, those kinds of goals, not really measurable, but, you know, 60 days are, and that's something you can point to. And whenever uh, we look back at the war, one of the big mistakes that the Mitanni made in the propaganda part of the war was to put up something that they could look at, which was the timer board and say, look at these timers. What we're going to do is we're going to watch these timers and you're going to see tests stall at destroying our structures. And that's what they were betting on. Uh, but that didn't happen and they actually started losing structures. So that timer board that was public went private so that they couldn't actually look, you know, the public couldn't look at it anymore because they were starting to lose structures too fast. And it's so a good thing. The doom, doom clock. The doom clock that we're talking about. Thank you. The doom clock. Yeah. So uh, again, putting down deadlines, putting down measurable goals, these things create propaganda opportunities to say, you're not winning or you're not uh, defending well enough, you're losing. Uh, and these things will work on membership as they start to hear messaging from the other side saying, give up, give up. Your cause is futile. All right. Yeah, I mean, that's the art of message, the art of propaganda, right? You yeah. can change it however you, look, however you want it to, to look like. Yeah, yeah, and that stuff's super interesting. That's a great part of the game, as long as it doesn't get toxic when it just derails the whole neatness of it and turns it into just garbage. Okay, total production value by region, the forge, just destroying everything else still. Not surprising. I think a lot of the... Capital building is kind of slowed. The only people I know building capitals are people who are experimenting with um, assembly lines. In other words, they're actually investing in knowledge, uh, call it R&D, where they're, they're building stuff at you know high prices, not to sell them and make money, but just to learn how to manage uh, the system now. And that's, that's going to pay dividends later on. 
But uh, people still building in Jita because Jita is where you build equipment that you want to use. Uh, you have yeah. all the ingredients that you have there. I think a lot of that is just small modules, small ships, destroyers, cruisers, stuff like that. Nothing big at the moment, I think, is being built. Although the, the battleship market, they are going down in price. They're going back to where they were before the industrial change. I think a uh, part of that is Nozick, maybe. Things like uh, things like Frat, right? They're so close to Jita, and so maybe they can haul in more production that they have done. So, yeah. yeah. And they also, Fraternity, has said they're going to go in direct competition to Tranquility Trade uh, Commission, which is not only the trade tower, the Tranquility Trade Tower and Perimeter, it's a bit more than that. Uh, and the Fraternity has said they were left out of that uh, commission, and so they're going to start their own Chamber of Commerce. I think it's the Fraternity Chamber of Commerce. And they're putting down a Keepstar near Mela to make it a marketplace of their own in the forge so you will see the forge actually gain in production value as things get built there in low sec especially capitals can be they can actually be built there undocked and jumped to wherever they need to go and so they can also sense. be traded there too exactly. either on contract or on market exactly good point so we'll look look for that we'll look for that to see how that's going yet another place where uh, Noros is making some interesting moves. Uh, we said it a long time ago. Noros is the guy to watch. He's doing some interesting stuff. He's got diversity. He's put himself in a good position. Uh, if this war falls apart, it's not falling apart on him. So sun Saturday is going to be interesting to see like, you know, what cards are going to be played. No offense to AOM. I like AOM. You guys uh, strike me as mature. <laughs> if, uh, if I was going to join a, a late night uh, team, I would definitely look at your team. Uh, I like you guys, Fulcrum. Uh, yeah. you, got, you guys are good. Yeah, well, we're still in conflict. I mean, we're each other's content. So, yeah. we're, well, we're not, it's not really one sided as, as of right now. Like, we're so far away from each other. So, it's kind of balanced out by the distance. Uh, but things can get spicy at times. Oh, I think when, it's going to get when spicy. Right wormhole. They're There's coming. a right one hole from Veil of Silence to Esoteric. <laughs> Something's going to happen. <laughs> They're coming for your ESS uh, winnings. Uh, look out. You, you guys should be going over there for theirs. We're, I think we're trying to develop uh, a, a doctrine, a strategy to, to defend it. Yeah. Yeah. Good for you. Uh, we'll see how that turns out for everybody. All right. Trade balance regions. Uh, ba trade balance region. Let's go on to some other stuff here. Total market value in region. God, the forge just stuns everybody else. So they have to take the forge out because you can see it's just, what is that? Eight, nine times the next competitor. It's a lot of wealth in the forge. Poor domain. <laughs> yeah. Overshadowed. Yeah. So you take... Uh, this next uh, there's a graph we're looking at now is you just take the forge out and uh and still you see the second place uh domain dwarfs the competition as well total market va trade value in region uh so domain and G uh, uh the forge yeah. just so domain is the amarian uh trade hub so their main trade hub uh system is called the amar or amar so yeah, yeah. that's why you see two different Let's actually take a closer look at these uh, these other trade hubs. So if you want to know, if you're trying to figure out where to live and where the trade hubs are, they have been the same for about 10 years at least, maybe 15 years. Uh, domain is uh, second only to the Forge. The Forge, the city basically, or the system is Jita. Uh, domain has Amar, that's the system in Domain. But let's look at these other ones. Uh, Cinque Zone is a region. For Galente and its capital for trade is going to be Dodixi. It wasn't always Dodixi. It used to be Urzalart, uh, but it's changed to Dodixi. And then Lone Trek, which is right next to the Forge. So it's kind of, uh, uh, it's kind of benefits from being right next to the Forge. But Lone Trek is ha has a lot of rich, low sec. Uh, it is an interesting region. It's kind of overlooked a little bit, but it's got a nice hard edge to it as far as reputation goes. And it also has some three or four little trade hubs in it. Uh, and then you have Delve, and that's what I wanted to point to. So the amount of money basically moving around inside of Delve is basically equivalent to Lone Trek. 
And that is because there's a lot of NullSec living inside of Delve at this very moment. So it's, uh, it's interesting to see here how, as far as trade value goes, Delve, which is NullSec with a few groups missing compared to HiSec, right? And HiSec dwarfs it. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it from a commerce perspective, uh, in terms of the idea of Blue Donut, right? It's a great idea. Right, everyone comes together in one system to trade, uh, to produce stuff, to mine stuff, or to bring resources together. Right? It's a great trade spot for everyone in the blue donut. Yeah, that's interesting. So the blue donut in Delve, the whole thing. We're not talking about a political donut. We're talking about trade donut, uh, and that is equivalent to Lone Trek, which is still, you know, only gets you to fourth, fifth place. Behind yeah. Delve, though, is Metropolis and the Minmatar areas. Uh, Heck being uh, inside of Metropolis. And Heymatar, which comes uh, after Metropolis, is Renz. And Renz is really not what it used to be. I think 10, 15 years ago, Renz used to be easily one of the four trade hubs. But it's lost its place uh, for many reasons. But mostly Metropolis took half of its uh, clientele. So there you go. All right, imports and exports. What's interesting about EVE Online's imports and exports page is it tells you the equipment that has moved in and the equipment that has moved out. What it doesn't tell you, was that equipment sold? Was that exported for sale? Or were those just ships moving through the system? And so it's not a great indicator for economy. That, it's not the great indicator we would want to have, uh, but it does show you where things are moving. So if you see a giant capital fleet moving away for a deployment to a different region, that actually registers as exports and then imports to the to the area that they move into, uh, and that's kind of interesting. But wish this yeah. was more economic. Yeah, so that's a great point. So maybe after the announcement on Saturday, if let's say in July's economic report we see a giant spike in nearby regions compared to Delft, there's a giant spike in both export and import. That means. Uh, all of those alliances were based uh, not in Delft or not in the uh, Delft quarter. They're moving their capitals and super capitals or their standard auctions from, from their home to uh, the war front, which is Delft. Yes, or the opposite. They may actually vacate Delve and move yeah. back. Yeah. Right? Or yeah. I think Nora said, right, there's the other option of uh, everyone getting uh, new to each other, like uh, basically plus zero to each other for for some time and then do it in the orderly fashion. So people can still have the content, uh, but at the same time, they're still united uh, in front of Imperium. Yeah. Uh, so Akaroth says there was a Reddit thread about it yesterday or so. It's fairly widespread that folks aren't building caps. And that makes total sense, by the way. It's expensive to build capitals right now, and uh, you might want to wait on that sort of decision. Unless you're experimenting, again, people who are building capitals now are experimenting with assembly lines and uh, techniques and shortcuts and where they can trim and what's important and what's not important. They're figuring that stuff out, um, but they're also doing it at a loss. Okay, so looking at this, uh, we can see Genesis. Ah, that's interesting. Genesis. What's going on in Genesis? We have uh, import, export. Well, they kind of wipe each other out, but there's some movement going on there. So the thing with Genesis, remember the gate building event? Right, right. A lot of the gates is going to Genesis. So there's a route from Jita to Amar that takes one low sec Genesis. Mm. And if you can go get through there, let's say with a blockade runner or with some sort of protection with your freighter, right? That's a great spot to go through. It, it, it cuts like the route by like uh, tw uh, twice or like three times, something like that. Wow. So, much short, much bigger shortcut. So those new gates are already making a difference as far as trade routes. If you look at Genesis, that's my theory of yeah. why the import export going up so high. I wonder, let's divert a little bit. We'll go to Genesis on the map. Uh, actually, we could do this in the game, right? Let's do that. Sometimes it's a little bit easier to see things. So we're looking at Genesis here, and I'll look at statistics in the game for, 
not ships destroyed in the last 24 hours, but if I go to geography and statistics, I can go down to uh, jumps in the last 24 hours right here. Or let's Yeah, let's do last 24. Here's jumps in the last hour. Why aren't these in alphabetical order? Or maybe there are no jumps in the last 24 hours. Yeah, okay, let's just do the last hour then. I find this map not all that helpful. Genesis. Yeah, here. if you look at the grander scale, I think Dolan can do a better job. So it's so scattered. There's so many links between each system. Yeah, game. look at that. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the thing with Eve map is it has it, it's not a flat paper, so some system may be on top of another system. Yeah, so it can get messy at times. Yeah, I'm looking at this. Uh... All right, actually, this kind of excites me to go look. I forgot about the new mat, the new gates, and what that does. So I'm gonna I'm gonna check that out. Spend some time with it. Okay, uh, but I, I was also gonna go here to see if we could. Actually, I don't need to do that. I'll go to Genesis here. You know, I can never find what I'm looking for on this thing. It is a big map. <laughs> yeah. Where is that new gate? Uh, where is it on this map? Corazor, Corazor, Aridia. I think so. Ah, Benzel. I think someone said in chat. A H B A Z O N. I mean, you can see on the line, it's very clear. Let's just go to universe. I'll see if I can find it. You can do it. <laughs> I can do it. Thank you. Oh, and there it is, the forge. Oh, thank you. I totally missed it. I walked all around. It's right here. And to make it easier to see, I'll zoom in. That's new. Yeah. Akota takes you right into here. Oh, you know what we can do here? Instead of looking at security, we can see jumps in the last 24 hours. Yeah, you can see the pattern of jumps increasing quite a bit. Uh, and you can see how that turned dark green. There's 3,000 jumps in the last 24 hours there. So it's being used. It's not overwhelming like this. Uh, these other well-tread areas like uh, Tar and uh, Pakshi, those have like 12,000. But this is a good fourth of that. And before, if you look at its neighbors, it used to be like 300. So it's gone up, um, you know, tenfold, hundredfold. Again, have to keep our eyes open for that. Thanks for uh, giving us that system name. Okay, uh, we are just about through with the monthly economic report for June. Remember, we were looking at this because we knew it was going to be important this month to see how, how bad the PCU slump was. And we did see early on that this was, uh, there were financial indicators that the slump was uh, slowing down activity. Oh, faucets and sinks. For those that say you can't make money in EVE, this graph begs to differ. The blue are the faucets, and they are $86 trillion made last month in June. Remember, this is when the PCU is tanking. Uh, and the sinks are 56 and 50, sorry, 57, um, 57 trillion. So let's go in and look at that. Commodity market on top. Look at that. 32 trillion commodities market. What's in the commodities market? Uh, so that will be an uh, overseer effect. That will be the trade labeling data sheet. That will be the blue loot from JSpace. Uh, so basically anything that you can sell to, to MPC. So we had a recent event with uh, the the Mimitar Liberation Day, so all the tokens that you get count as uh, commodities uh, that you can sell towards NDCs. Right. So that events will help boost those commodities, but they are way ahead of everything else, right? Yeah, generally speaking, I think that's how it goes, right? When you have a non seg escalation, uh, an overseer effect can go up to 
uh, let's say 130 million each. Uh, yeah, so there's also, I think someone mentioned in chat, ESS tokens, right? Those are all, con all forms of uh, commodities that you can sell to NPCs. Yeah, and that's about to become... I don't know if they're, they're not counted when they're, they're counted, I'm sure when they're created or given to players, that must be when they're counted and that's going to grow tremendously. I think we have 20 trillion out there in those grand heist long-term banks that are opening up soon. Exactly. So we're going to see in the next month or two that this number of commodity uh, on the ISK faucet will grow like crazy because of those uh, ESS tokens because they have to be... Uh, uh, taken out as a token or as some sort of uh, uh, commodity, not directly paid into someone's wallet. Yeah. So what this tells me is that if you want to make real money these days in EVE Online, you got to get into the commodities business, which means going out there, being active, destroying things, grabbing that commodity and taking it to the market to sell it. That means active gameplay. That's not really uh, as bottable as, say, mining might be, or just ratting for bounties. The bounties are second on this list, but they come up... Uh, are they second? Yeah, they're second. They come up to 19 trillion, basically. So uh, commodities, 32 billion. Bounties, a little under 20, mil 20 uh, trillion. Both those are trillions. Yeah, so... Uh... So that's actually a very interesting thing to note uh, that anything that involves com commodity usually is active game play, right? So if you look at the trigger limit data sheet, that's a uh, trigger limit dead space, uh, which you have to be active. You have 20 minute timer, otherwise, you're going to be done. Uh, you're you're going to be dead with your ship and your pod, right? If you look at uh, the writing sites in, in J space, in wormholes, uh, you have to be very active in that. People are doing. Uh, uh, more orders, doing dreadouts uh, in those sites, you have to be very active. And things like ESS, you have to be active no matter what, right? You steal a ESS, right? Yep. Yeah, so it's all those things you have to be active with. Got to be wide awake in a situation that's constantly changing. That's not as easily bottable as uh, it was before, right? I mean, let's face it, EVE Online has been alt heavy, bot heavy because it makes sense to automate as much as you can since it's a game that works on time. So the more, the more you can program to work round the clock, the richer you're going to feel. And CCP is really, really in the last four years, or no, not, not that long, really since the last two years, focused on making gameplay more active to try to get people out there to create situations that are uh, too novel to bot or AFK. That's what they're trying to do. It's pretty clear. And they're doing yeah. it, you can see. Yeah, the money. So, I mean, they also see that with their future plan, right? I think capital ratting and capital mining are coming. I think those, yeah, if anyone has done any of those, uh, it, it is very highly recommended. Don't go F AFK. Even with the Royal Cloud, don't go AFK. <laughs> right. Which, you know, puts a damper on things because if you can have somebody mining, all night, all day, uh, you're going to have plenty of resources when you wake up, you know, or the next day. Whereas if it takes awake time and a person has to sit at the keys and pay attention, they can't just drift off and watch a movie. You're going to see a lot less resources because it's actually going to be painful to get those resources. It's going to take attention. And I think the economy will constrict because of that as well. That's part of the scarcity is to push what could have been automated onto man hours, we call it. It's a man hour penalty. And the more that CCP does that, the more scarce the thing, things are going to become, the more they'll be worth actually doing. Okay. Um, incursions, you know, incursions don't sleep on incursions here. Their reward payout come in, uh, come in on number three. And incursions are almost as much as ratting these days at 15, basically 16 trillion. What do you make of that? I mean, I think part of that may be, okay, this is just my theory. A lot of Imperium uh, members that since uh, Delve is kind of fallen, they don't really have a place to rat or to make money. They turn to high sec incursions. Mm. Uh, so uh, just, just my theory feels, that, that's what I can see the 
equivalent of non-stack routing, but it requires much higher investments, both in skill point and in ships wow. or equipment in general. Well, they have that right. though, right? It's usually yeah, they do have that. They, they do have the the money that they uh, that they accumulated during their years in a. Uh, in Delph or in queries or in period basis. Yeah, great point. I didn't know that. And you know, there is kind of a proxy war going on. That's not the right word for it, but there is an attempt by Pappy, uh, at least there was, at least they said there was, I never saw much evidence of it, to really stomp out either allies of the Imperium that were out there doing stuff or alts of the Imperium that were out there doing stuff. And so incursions was not something that came up on the radar until you just said it, so. Interesting. All right, and uh, ESS main bank auto payments. I imagine that's the stuff that's set aside. Uh, nine trillion should be. Let's see, nine trillion out of twenty. I think that's right. so, is it forty percent usually? Yeah. So, but you have to you have to also compare that a lot of those money uh, they get taken out. They don't. Uh, it's not everything is paid out to, oh. to players. You do have people stealing it. So it is normal to see them below the 40% threshold. But that uh, 20 trillion, I think, for mm -hmm. bounty, that's 100% the 60%. So if you divide it that, you can see the total ratting uh, in ISK with assuming that there's no ISK to be stolen from the main bank. All right, let's look at some of the drains here. Transaction tax is taking out about 14 trillion. Broker's fees, kind of a kind of a secondary tax, really, right? You have to pay it if you're buying stuff out of markets. Uh, and those are about 9 trillion. Uh, the rest of the expenses that take money out of the game, out of circulation, uh, is the LP store, blueprints, and skill purchases. Okay. Let's go and look at, here is a chart that uh, shows the stuff that we just talked about, but graphically, I, I prefer the way we just did it. It makes more sense, you can see. Uh, but as you can see, sleeper components there in blue, this is the commodities, right? This is again, what was that, 32 trillion, and this is how it breaks down. Uh, a lot of that, about six and a half, seven trillion is sleepers. Uh, components those come from wormhole space so that's still going on it looks like it's down a little bit from march and april but uh it's still strong that's a lot and then the overseer effects that we were just talking about are let me zoom in on this for you what were you going to say uh so overseer effect is really flattening out so i think mm -hmm. maybe that's where it's going to settle down so, I mean, overseer effects represent the amount of escalations that's being run in in all sec, in high sec, in low sec, right? So, the I mean, it the fact that it go way down means that people are, less people are ratting, so there there are less people triggering all those escalations. Uh, that's why you see that huge uh, decline uh, right there. Uh, also with sleeper components, uh, an interesting thought from, I think I heard from this from a lot of uh, wormhole people, that uh, a lot of NOSEC blocks, they're starting to uh, not invade, but try to use wormhole as way of making ISK. Uh, so, I mean, traditionally, I think a lot of wormholers, they live in wormholes, they have structures, uh, they have POCO, they, they do their daily life in uh, in wormhole, but right now a lot of nullsecers uh, or nullsec people, they do day trips or just safe lock their uh, dread out or marauders in a in a wormhole to to keep using it next next time they lock in. Got it. You're right. Uh, Overseer effects and triglavian data uh, have come down to to about parity, so they're both about. Well, let's look at this chart. Just under two trillion each. Wow, everything else, uh, bounty encrypted bonds and empire insignia drops, all that is just negligible compared to sleepers, overseer, and triglavian data. Now, in the middle of that, I kept bringing up the wrong graph. I was bringing up this 10 faucets and sinks over time. Uh, this is... Hmm, daily ISK 
net faucets. Ten discs and sinks faucets over time. Huh. Is this what we were just looking at with the, uh, yeah, commodity market, agent mission rewards. Yeah. So. Yeah, uh, I think. Yeah, this is what we were, this is the graph that we should, were looking at. Um, I got confused and showed you what the breakdown of commodities were, but this is the breakout of all income uh, and actually stuff that drains out of the game. And so we look for patterns here, like these green drops here means something happened with asset safety recovery tax. Look at that asset safety in April. Huh. What was going on in April? There was an announcement that prices were going to go up on building things, which means their value was going to go up as the market started buying things that were produced for more money. They would pay more money for those things and their overall price would go up. And then the insurance prices on those would go up and the asset safety recovery costs would go up. Because if you have something that's worth 20 ISK on one day and a week later it's worth 200 ISK, and you have to pay 10% of that in asset safety recovery fees, you better do it when it's worth 20 and get the lower rate as opposed to waiting for the price to go up and then paying the higher rate when it's 200. Yeah, and also around that time, I think that's the end of the structure grind and the beginning of the siege. So most of the structures uh, in Delft were destroyed. So I think a lot of Imperial members, if they had anything that they left in the structures, it will be as a safety to, to low sec. Right. And that's when you want to cash it out. Because I think when, when a structure is destroyed, your stuff arrives at the low sec station and is safe. Uh, but until you yeah. actually pay for it, it doesn't get counted on this. Yeah, exactly. So, so it, yeah. it requires a lot of risk to, to pull them out if it's expensive, uh, like a super or like a capital. Right. So that's very interesting, very telling. Um, over here in June, July, I don't see any major anomalies. So I don't see like a, a bunch of people moving their supers to cash them out of asset safety. <laughs> but April, something happened there. Uh, okay. And, and there's a double dip there, which is interesting in May as well. So... So looking at the profitability, though, we were just talking about this, the commodities up there with bounty prizes. Now, I thought that these were a lot different. So what am I missing here? The bounty prizes should be 32 commodity. Commodities were 32 trillion and bounties were like 19 trillion. So why are these things so close on the graph? I don't understand that. Uh, uh, I think... Uh, I think commodity here, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's interesting. Um, I'll have to look into that. But one thing that's interesting here, if this graph is correct, is just how steady. There's a little bit of a dip here. You see that, that dip there? That's, um, yeah, pretty much uh, May and June. Dips a little bit. And here as well, it dips a little bit. It's kind of rounding down. Not a lot. We've seen bigger drops before, bigger sudden drops. So that's really interesting. The PCU might be down, but people are still making money. Uh, the money's still being made. All right, let's look at a couple more things. Money supply, comparing corporations to individual people and where the money is. Uh, and you can see characters have really flatlined uh, in the last mm, two years. Uh, they had been doing this nice climb from, I can't see those numbers, but it looks like 80 trillion all the way up to over a hundred and 110 trillion. That's a lot of, um, is that even trillion? Yeah, that's uh, eight, 800 trillion over to about 1100 trillion, 300, tri 300 trillion difference in personal income growth since uh, 2016. So think about that number. That's the obscenity of abundance economy, where people individually were making that much money uh, because they were doing it in big, big cycles. Uh, then you have uh, a real drop that happens in 2019. That's because of blackout and essentially the end of that lifestyle. 
And so you see that slide dramatically down. I also think that might be a lot of players who are very wealthy or uh, leaving the game because that's when money leaves the game there. They take their money with them. It just dies in their accounts. Uh, and since then, you've seen some income growth uh, in, over the COVID period of 2020 and the war period that we're in. And into the first six months of this year, 2021, you could see it is a slowly dipping for players. Now, if you look at corporations, very steady, not really much movement there. And it's always been about, well, if we just look at that, it's, it used to be about one fourth what players had, a corporation might have. In here, you uh, have increased it to about one fifth. So players getting more money in their pocket than corporations are in theirs, comparatively. Velocity of ISK, we always look at velocity of ISK to see if the economy is moving. Again, if you don't know what, sorry, velocity of ISK is how many times a coin will trade hands. And so that just means like, what's the frequency of trading goods? Uh, and as it slows or goes down to uh, one, I think is the normal, not the normal, but it's the baseline as it comes down, that means that something trades hands maybe, um, once uh, it just means the economy is not moving it's not on fire or anything and it has been going down and since april uh sorry since march really it's been it's been going down 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 so the economy slowing that is a direct correlation with essentially announcements of production changes which would make people want to wait wait and see save your stuff you might see some buying frenzies here and there uh, to pick up supplies that you would need, that sort of stuff. But overall, I think demand starts to slow when there's instability about what the future holds. Uh, yeah. So I think Abby wrote into a note that this, together with pro lower production, lower destruction, really shows the low PCUs that we're, exper we're experiencing right now in the game. Right. So this is... a. Uh... Players not here means no activity for those players that might otherwise be here. Whether they're docked up and buying things or out in space and shooting and destroying each other, doesn't matter. They still affect velocity. Actually, the docked guys probably do it more than the other guys. So you can see that uh, people not being online has affected that. Wild. Okay, finally, the economic indices. Uh, we look at the consumer price index versus the market, uh, the mineral price index, excuse me, and the uh, primary and secondary uh, markets. We'll actually just look at the, um, let's look at just the three-year mining one here. As you can see, the mineral prices are coming down and coming down fast. That's quite a peak that happened in April. And it is just dropping since then. So the mineral price index dropping means mineral prices are coming down. Um, probably because of surplus. And again, people don't want to spend a bunch of money to hold on to minerals they may not build with. Yeah, and I think a lot of people who are, who are used to build like capitals or super capitals, they're still waiting for those stocks to be depleted. So the new newly built capitals can actually worth uh, or higher than the input material cost. Yeah, that's, that's why you see like a lot of people like uh, stop or uh, pause the, their action to buy, uh, to buy minerals. I'm looking at this trying to figure out well, scarcity began over here and that's uh, I want to say Let's just say January. I think it was last. Does it say right here? Let's see. Let me bring this up. The big one is last uh, October, November-ish in 2020. Uh, so that one really separate the ores for high sec wars, titanium, pyrite, and maxon. Low sec war is uh, isogen, noxium. And uh, yeah, I think this isogen and noxium and no sec war is zydron and megoxide. So, so when you separate those things out, uh, it tends to, so it's harder for miners to mine those things, which means a higher price. Let's look at Invasion Chapter Two, which uh, I think that was where scarcity flipped some stuff up. 
I'm looking at the, sh at the notes now. Updates to loyalty points, shareable bookmarkers, because that's the low point. I mean, that's what marks uh, when minerals were there uh, cheapest. And I believe scarcity or the announcements of scarcity or whatever, indications that it was going to be harder to find minerals happened there. Now, what happens with uh, shortages, like not sh perceived shortages is the price goes up. And that's why you see this thing just climb to ungodly heights. Uh, and now when they made production changes, as you know, they're surplus of uh, ore that you can see this stuff coming down rapidly, just as rapidly as it went up, if not faster. That's interesting stuff. Look, the takeaway from this report, this monthly economic report is, yes, the PCU went down. Economic indicators also went down because there's less players in the game, even in stations sitting there trading or whatever. And the second major takeaway is that commodities are just skyrocketing compared to com um, NPC ratting and those kinds of incomes. So active income, good. Passive income, not as good as it was. What's your takeaway? Uh, I would say we can really see the uh, aftermath of the industrial change. I see high high prices for for capitals, especially if you look closer in the open contract or public uh, contract, you can see capital price really went up. But you do see that the low PCU, right? You can see that in a lot of places on the graph, which are like production versus destruction, uh, the velocity of ISK, everything's going down. Yeah. So it all relates to each other, um, but. Uh, I think this is really like a low period. I think we have uh, explained this in some of the previous episodes uh, that there's multiple factors uh, in this, right? If you have COVID is uh, uh, getting away from us, uh, you have summers back. Uh, and then, I mean, it's just the fact that a, a lot of ships are going high market in price makes a lot of people tend to hesitate uh i would say to 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 try to really make some is and to, to pursue their next goal right say my next goal is the capital before the change right now the capital is like three times higher than what it was then there's a uh, rationally there's like a question that i will ask myself is this worth my time or is this worth effort right and uh, i think with uh, there's uh, so with harder lower income right you have ways you have the uh, dynamic bounty system and the ESS to really reduce the income for normal players and you have this high price all of those things working together really make this game at least from like, I'd say a player perspective hard maybe it's like I think people are saying this is good for the game but for player perspective it is really hard so uh pink rabbit i think says blue donut equals no destruction i've heard that criticism before we can look on this graph and i don't see a major difference between before and after the war so that just doesn't ring true if you look uh destruction numbers am i looking at the right stuff yeah destroyed in blue uh pretty much between one and one and a half trillion per month that's a pretty steady amount um, it does tick up in January of 2020, and that was pre-war. It goes to about two, and then it starts coming down with a big hump right at June. Um, and since then, it's really kind of stayed at about one to 1.5 trillion. So in reality, this war has created some spikes of destruction, but if you take those spikes out, it hasn't really made more destruction or less destruction uh, in EVE Online. So yeah, I, I agree with that. And also I think uh, the amount of destruction stuff uh, is, has, hasn't changed, but the type of, or the way that battle is being fought is, has changed, right? So beforehand you have alliances fighting each other, right? Uh, small scale or medium scale fights. Uh, but right now you see really those big, big battles uh, with 
full fleets or multiple full fleets of ships fighting each other. Yeah, uh, Krish35, Crash4035 says, uh, scarcity means no destruction. People do not want to risk shiny ships. That is also true, to be honest. I disagree with that. I don't think it's a matter of... It's not a matter of cost. It's a matter of uh, stockpiles. And uh, the stockpiles are still there. So, uh, again, if I have 10 ships, I don't care how much they cost. Uh, maybe they're perceived value if I sell them or whatever. But if I just want to use them, I don't really care about using them until I'm down to like four. And then I start thinking like, oh, well, I... I better start either making more or I better start slowing down using these things. But if I have ships that are an endless amount, and maybe he says here, risk shiny ships. So let's say it's not the subcapitals. Then, uh, yeah, if you want to sell them, if you want to keep your wealth, that makes a little more sense. But I think way, way more important than do I want to sell this to somebody is the equation of can I put this in a fight that will be fun? Can I put this into a fight where I might win? If I have a dreadnought, I think of it as something I could sell, but I also think of it as something I could use in a dread fleet or dread bomb. And those opportunities are more important than what it would give me if I sold it, right? Players want to play for those big heightened moments of fun. And if they can get in on that in a safe way and, and keep what they have, they're going to do that. Now, if I had a, a dreadnought, I wouldn't just use it to do a drive-by like they used to do, right? Because I don't want to lose it stupidly or I don't want to put it at high risk. But the situations that players play in are mostly, we think we can win, let's do this. And so they're going to do that, I think, the same. The only thing I would think is if you only have one Dreadnought, then you're like, no, it has to be a really good situation for me to use it. Uh, it's, not, it's not an issue of money. It's an issue of, do I want to waste it? Um, I think that's what it's at. For some people, it might be an issue of money. It depends on the ship. But again, right circumstances, you'll try to use it. Wrong circumstances, you won't. And that starts to become more and more dependent on players and what, cir what circumstances they can build rather than money considerations. And I would say it's about replacing the ship a lot of times. Uh, even though if I have, let's say, two or three dreads, I still do want to replace that to keep a full stock right um mm -hmm. for emergency uses right sometimes maybe there's a dread battle happening right outside my door uh i need after my dread bomb is in i need to do another dread bomb to to kill to basically more like uh, reinforcements more reinforcement please mm -hmm. right so you do have those considerations so basically is if you have everything srp then stuff like that it's, it's not really a big problem but uh yeah if from a personal perspective especially if let's say there's no reinforcement on your own risk people are going to be more hesitant since it's harder and harder yeah. to replace them i'll tell you what will go away which may affect combat or situations again is a uh, ship replacement program so as uh, crash 35 says most uh, have one or no dreads and that's true uh, but if you have one dread and you have a ship replacement program you will use that there will be no consideration about uh, should I or shouldn't I? Uh, there will be, but there is not going to be consideration of the individual members. It's going to be consideration of uh, FC. Right. Exactly. Well, the FC risk it. And so he's got to look for a better situation for that. But uh, I think what this says is, it, I think a lot of FCs won't necessarily back down from a fight. They'll just really consider the consequences, which makes everything more heightened, Right. That's what's important about scarcity. It brings excitement back into the game. If an FC sees a situation that he can capitalize on when dreadnoughts are abundant, there's not much of a decision there. Let's try it. If we all die, so what? We'll replace them. We have 100 of them. And that's a broken game. Uh, at least the value proposition is totally broken from, for that. I think what happens now is the FC has to really consider. And then you have... Uh, thoughtful FCs versus reckless FCs and, you know, that dynamic at work. I think that'll be really interesting. Uh, I would say, like, and if anything, scarcity has to bring, let's say, a barrier. Uh, so people who used to just come in to have some fun, to do some AFK writing, to stuff like that, 
they have to really stop that and it's really getting more and more hardcore i would say in some way so mm. and that's basically like a filter filtering out people who aren't like that right who aren't that committed to to eve so that's why you see lowering and lower and lower numbers yeah well i think scarcity uh there's a few points from people in chat that maybe we can get to them but we should wrap up uh I think scarcity brings down it's it's counterintuitive. I think what it what it does it's going to make people downship. If you want to have that repetitive fun, you're either going to pay a premium, which is hard to get, uh, or you're going to downship. If you downship, you can go forever, right? Minerals are cheaper, ships to build are cheaper if you downship to battleship and below, which is very respectable. So subcap fleets very cheap. T1 we're talking about, not necessarily T2, because uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, different stuff that goes into those. But the idea is that if you want to play this game and repetitively fight, there is an avenue for that. If you want to collect nice ships and fight in those and, and be super efficient with super expensive stuff or play at a higher thrill rate and risk more, there's an avenue for that too. But what I think it does more than anything else is it allows these players that are coming into the game to be a lot closer to the veterans that are here. I think it does do that. If veterans are downshipping to fight more and new players are coming in and can really get into T1 a lot easier than they get into anything else because they're skill limited or money limited, you're seeing the game compress into a nice area of sub-capital fleets uh, fighting each other, which would be interesting. Yeah, but that that's really like an you know, ideal situation or, uh, where it the situation can be different from like fights for fights. So we have to really look at individual situations to, to say like, if it's really worth it to lower your ship class. I agree, but the pressures are moving in that direction. So we'll see where they end up. All right, Shannon, we were going to go through some numbers on the economy. Why don't we save that for tomorrow and do like a part two where we do that since uh, we had CVA, uh, talk to us earlier today and that took a little bit longer than expected what do you think yeah yeah sure that sounds good it's already like an hour and 30 minutes yeah. over yeah we're way over yeah this is supposed to be a yeah. one hour it should and, be wrapped up <laughs> yeah 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 but we'll we'll come back tomorrow we'll take a look at uh the economy we'll look at uh plex and injectors and uh take a look at some equipment see where it's at and look for some anomalies and talk about why they're anomalies in the first place Shen, thanks for coming around. Always appreciate you being here. Uh, thank you, uh, audience, for hanging out with us. Uh, we will now send you over. We'll try to raid somebody for you, but uh, uh, we will uh, uh, thank you now and see you tomorrow for more Talking In Stations.